um, that I have a more cheerful item of news that is, might be interpreted as a kind of a supernatural sign of some sort, perhaps, and it is this. One of our novices has a brother who is in the Marines. Now, this brother is stationed in Florida, and it happens that at the present time in Florida, they've had a competition, a beauty contest for Miss Universe. Now, on these occasions, the Marines are called upon to escort each one of the contestants, and our brother's brother was picked to escort, guess who? Miss Norway. <laughs> <laughs> without anybody knowing anything about it or anything like that, or don't, don't, without anybody knowing it, Miss Norway. Now, if that isn't the finger of God, <laughs> well, probably when, when we get to Norway, she'll be right there on the front steps. <laughs> so, fellas, plan to pack your bags. <laughs> but anyway, pray for Miss Norway, for the brother of our brother, and so forth. Now, let's get a, dig in here a little bit, again, the Greek tragedy. Uh, the big lesson that you get out of Greek tragedy, is that what, what, what it's all about now, this is not just entertainment, see. Greek tragedy was the meditation of the whole Athenian people and these other Greek cities. It's a meditation on the meaning of life, see. And it's also a celebration of what they believe to be the truth about life. So that... Uh, well, remember that your Greek tragedy is a liturgical action, see? And participation in this tragedy is kind of, uh, it, it brings about a religious purification and a religious deepening of understanding of what life is about. And the great truth, see, the, the, the thing that tragedy does, the Greek tragedy does, it faces the truth of life. It does not avoid the truth of life. Uh, remember the, what I said last time about these different views of life that you had in Greece, see? Now, the tragic poets, although they probably weren't too articulate about it, probably felt that they were the ones who were really looking at life as it was, and that the Homeric people were selling, uh, selling a too optimistic a bill of goods, see, and that maybe the Ionians were Im impious, see, because they were more materialistic than anything else, and that the Socratic people were also tending to be impious because they were too rationalistic, and so forth. But anyway... They look at life and the structure of life and what they believe to be the great lesson of life. And the great lesson of life for the Greek tragedy people is, uh, if you think back to what we were talking about, the Chinese, this, this Chinese stuff there about this center, you know, this center in the, uh, hitting the exact center of, of where all things converge, the, the point, the still point at the center of the wheel and that sort of thing. And the Greeks are thinking pretty much along those lines, too. The idea that there is, a, there is an exact right center, which is not the same for everybody. It, it, it varies according to situations and cases, because that's life. See, life is something moving, it's dynamic, and so forth. And the thing to do is to be moving with life in such a way that you are always close to this center, and then you are really living. You are living in truth, see. And uh, so the, the, uh, the great lesson there, but of course this is an ideal, and nobody does it. And so the Greeks accept this, see, they accept the fact that this is not really possible, because it would be part of the Homeric error, or the, the, the Apollonian or the Olympian error, would be to uh, teach people that it's easy to always maintain a state of perfect equilibrium, see, that you can always be in a state of perfect balance and always do exactly the right thing or pretty close to the right thing. This is, this is baloney because people don't act that way. And on the contrary, life is full of these violent eruptions of things that come along. And that it is, uh, so tragedy takes this into account. See, takes into account disorder. And tragedy is the one, the one great, uh, uh, sphere of Greek literature where, this, where the idea of disorder is taken care of and explained and accepted. And one of the basic things, of course this is one of the great lessons of all, all philosophies and the great, great lesson of all life, is the first thing that a mature person has to know how to do is to accept disorder. See, You have to face the fact that, that while one has an ideal picture of how things are supposed to be in oneself and in the world, that this ideal is not realized. And instead of things approximating to what they should be, they are usually what they should not be. See, And a person who cannot accept this 
is going to have an awful lot of trouble. See, you have to accept this. It's one of the first things a person has to accept about life. It's the first thing you have to accept about the monastery. The first thing you have to accept about any kind of an organized existence or a disorganized existence. All existences are full of disorder. See? Things are always going wrong. They're supposed to go wrong. See? There has to be suffering. And so the point that Greek tragedy makes about this is that this is the precise point where a person has to learn to get with it. See, It's when there is disorder and suffering and injustice and chaos and so forth that you are at the precise psychological point where you can grow or diminish, see? And it's not, and neither one is a foregone conclusion. And so what you learn from Greek tragedy, by studying Greek tragedy, is you find the great people in Greek tragedy are the ones who catch this thing at its peak, see, and make a choice which may involve their physical destruction, but uh, they pass through destruction into wisdom, see? In other words, there is this victory over disorder and, and suffering and destruction and injustice and so forth. And this is one of the great lessons of all time. This is the same sort of thing that you're getting in another form in the Hebrew prophets. See? And so it's very interesting to study Greek tragedy in terms of, of this lesson that everybody was learning just about then. Furthermore, this lesson is, it was not just uh, expressed on an individualistic basis. It was seen in terms of society. And the Greeks uh, were taking stock of themselves as a people, as a society, see, and aware of the fact that they could go very wrong. And in fact, they did go very wrong. The whole place was torn up with this Peloponnesian War, which wrecked Greece, see. And you should study that. It was, it was interesting to read the Peloponnesian War. Who was the historian who wrote about the Peloponnesian War? Brother Stanislaus. You can't pronounce it. Thucydides. <laughs> No, Thucydides, Thucydides. Well, you're liable to get anything in the, uh, around here uh, after the mayor rise and, and uh, <laughs> so forth. <laughs> I, 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 at least uh, my hair became three shades whiter when I heard the native inhabitants of my paternal country <laughs> referred to as the mayor rise. <laughs> but anyway, Thucydides. Who is the other Greek, uh, great Greek historian who is not at all like Thucydides and was much more amusing in many respects? Herodotus? <laughs> Herodotus. Herodotus. Thucydides and Herodotus are the, are, the, are the two big... But Thucydides is a very, a very interesting... Because he's not only a historian, but he's a philosopher. And he studies the motives and the things that are going on in history and explains things. So Herodotus just has all kinds of crazy stories that he digs up from all over the place, which are very curious, but... And I don't have too much to do with history. Now, so your big lesson of Greek tragedy then is suffering leads to wisdom or can lead to wisdom. And uh, conversely, non-suffering, lack of suffering, can lead to stupidity. And the worst thing that can happen is that a person starts out with the stupidity that he, that he uh, acquires through not suffering ever and then gets into suffering and becomes obdurate in stupidity and completely destructive, see, and this is what you see, you see in some of these great tragedies of Aeschylus. We see this in the Antigone. In the Antigone, you see, for example, the tyrant Creon, who is really, he's, he's, he's the, the, the real villain of the thing, and he really wrecks himself and everybody else because he's so blame stubborn, insisting on having things his way, and having things in a way that uh, can't possibly fit in with reality, but is according to the law. And he's made the law, and this is the way it's going to be. See, I'm the boss, and this is the way I say it's going to be, and this is the way it's going to have to be, and he keeps pushing until the whole thing completely collapses on top of him. But there's also this a great deal of innocent suffering on the part of Antigone. And so then you, they, they meditate on this now, and this meditation takes the form of the audience is here, the chorus is out here expressing uh, kind of the, the general idea of what's going on, sort of meditating on it, and then beyond the chorus is this other world of the stage where these figures appear, as it were, as a kind of vision, see? And these, uh, it, it's a, uh, the stage, you get the impression that the stage is a totally different dimension. It's another world, and, these, and of course they, it is a different dimension. These people are all taller. Why are they all taller? Because they're wearing the cothurnus, which is a, uh, uh, doesn't like our, something on the principle of our shower clogs, but, but with clogs this thick, you know, so that they're a foot and a half higher than they should be. And they're wearing these masks, and they're wearing all these big uh, 
uh, special robes and that sort of thing. And that's a, it's a very stately, solemn sort of a deal. And then you see all these things, and you know what's going to happen, and it sort of works itself out really inexorably out there on the stage. And the whole audience is having this vision of the meaning of suffering. And, uh, and then what works itself out in this is the idea that the gods are behind all this uh, manipulating it, and that when a person is afflicted with hubris, which we were talking about before, what was hubris? What was that? What, what's, what's that all about, Brother Bosco? What was that hubris? Were you here when we were talking about that? What is it, Brother Hugh? This is pride. Pride. It's pride. Yeah, it's overweening self-confidence. So the, the 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 man or the society that gets afflicted with hubris, and the example we had, of course, was the Persian army. See Xerxes. I mean, yeah, the Xerxes and the Persian army. But all these tragic characters, if they're going to be destroyed, well, then they are allowed either guiltily or innocently to get into hubris. And it's more, innocent, it's more interesting when you've got a man who innocently, see, Oedipus innocently gets into hubris. The Oedipus, having already committed a, a terrible crime, which he doesn't know he's committed, uh, then goes along thinking that he's got everything under control and walks onto the stage saying, now we're, we, we're going to fix all this stuff and why are these people dying of the plague and that sort of thing. And he doesn't realize and the, 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 the plague goes round and round and round and round and round and finally centers on Oedipus. See? And then he realizes that he is the cause of all this. Well, all right, this is, the mechanism is the same. It's this hubris. But where the gods really want to mess somebody up is that when they find him with a little bit of deliberate hubris, they give him immediate success so that he goes, he really starts going. See? And that is the case, again, of Creon, and it's also the case of, of Xerxes here. Now, at the end of this uh, play, when they call up in the Persians we were talking about last time, and they call up the ghost of Darius, see, and Darius comes up, and he doesn't exactly know what's, what all is happening, but they tell him, and he says, oh, yeah, yeah, I could see it coming. That kid was always full of humor, you know, <laughs> and uh, he's, he's, uh, he developed this way. And then he said, some mighty power came upon him, and he lost his judgment. See, Now, this is the way the gods operate. When this man is, is full of power and success, and he's going 90 miles an hour, then instead of stopping him, which would be much too crude, see, the gods get behind him and push him so that he's going 180 miles an hour. And then, of course, they get him so he can't stop, and so he's really heading over the falls. And uh, so Darius gives this principle. When a man hastens to his own undoing, the gods, too, take part with him. See, this is one. And uh, all through your Greek tragedies, you get these statements, which are kind of statements of principle. See, when a man is, gets going uh, fast, the gods push him faster because they want to help him to wreck himself. See, and so this is one of your principles. Now, this principle, uh, what, was the, what was the real sin in which Xerxes' hubris manifested itself? Did anybody read the Persians? Was anybody, what, was his, what, was his, what was the real key fault, the one point where he really went off the beam, the, 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 the thing that he really did wrong? All right, but I mean, there was one incident. See, there was one crucial point in his progress towards doing this. Like, the one thing that he did was the most unusual thing, and he did it. And, yeah, what did he, how did he get his army across the Hellespont? What's the Hellespont or the Bosporus? Sea dividing the Yeah, it's just that little strait that goes between the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. Now, he had to get a Persian army into Greece. See? And what did he do with, with the Hellespont that was so bad? He yeah, he made a bridge of boats. He made a bridge of boats. And, and this, what he was doing, now, what, what was hubris? Uh, we'd say, well, that was kind of practical. It was a good thing to do. A smart fellow. See? No, no, for the Greek, oh, wait a minute now. That's not, that's not a smart thing to do at all. See, because what was he doing? He was, the Greeks were very, very leery of technical skill, see. We are at a period in history where the Greeks suddenly were getting this sense that they could develop a technology that would really get them somewhere, and they stopped, they held back. They were afraid to become too smart and to do things, I mean, as I said, the Ionians had the thing going, see. And the Greeks as a whole sort of held back and said, look, this technology stuff is all very well, but where is it going to get us? See, And they fall back on their big principle, which is the, key, the cardinal principle of all Greek thought, which is the principle of meden, meden agon, or naquid nemis, or nothing to excess. Don't, no, don't seek excess in anything, or don't allow yourself to go to excess in anything. Don't be excessively successful. See, It's good to 
and uh, not succeed too much. Don't get too rich. Don't get too smart. Don't get too uh, lucky or anything like that. See, so uh, made in Argon. Don't get to be too skillful with technology, and, and, and don't do this, don't have too big an army, and all that sort of stuff. This was deeply ingrained in the Greeks, and it's deeply ingrained in the Hebrews. And it's a, it's a phenomenon that apparently was very important in history at that particular period, see. And it's something that we've outlived, see. And we've outlived it maybe to our cost. See, this is the thing that we, we're starting to think, we're starting to realize now. See, now we've got this feeling. We've got the power, and we're the boss, and we can do what we want, and who's going to stop us? I mean, if, it, if, if we're going to land on Saturn and build a, a cover Saturn with a chain of, uh, of uh, supermarkets and cafeterias, we're going to do it, see? And it doesn't matter how stupid it is, but we're going to get there, and that's what we're going to do. Maybe what they saw on Mars. I wonder, wonder if, if when they were flying over Mars with that thing, if they developed those cameras, you know, those pictures, more and more and more, they'll see a little sign saying, Mars bars. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll find that they find that there's an underground factory where they're making all the Mars bars, <laughs> and it's on Mars. <laughs> and some some smart guy has got there ahead of everybody. So he's making all these Mars bars on Mars, <laughs> where the where the labor is cheap and there's plenty of Mars material to make Mars bars. Out of. <laughs> they just dig a shovel full of Mars. <laughs> That's what that goo is at the middle of the Mars bars. See, it's, it's the soil of Mars. <laughs> That's what you eat when you get that stuff in the... Well, anyway, this, this apparently was a great point in Greek history. Well, now, let's finally look at Antigone, just briefly at any rate. Um, Antigone is this, I would say, personally, it's one of the greatest of the Greek tragedies, perhaps the greatest, and it's one of the easiest to understand, and it's beautifully put together. It is simply, yeah? What happened to this guy from Bill? Oh, you wanted to know. <laughs> you want to know these details. <laughs> <laughs> well, what happened was he built this bridge and he got his army into Greece, but this was an act of hubris. It was an act. It was an insult to Neptune. <laughs> See, now that sounds, sounds a little corny when you put it that way. But what it was was it was a an overweening display of power and skill which the gods punished. See, he was too big for his britches building that darn bridge. That's the that's the the, the general impression that everybody had, including the Persians. See, everybody said, well. Come to think of it, Xerxes putting up that bridge was going a little bit far, see. And so he deserved what he got. And, uh, and in a certain sense, it's, this, this, is, this isn't just an idea. This is built into life, see. This is a truth which is in life. There comes a time when a person just does a little bit too much, see. He just pushes the thing a little bit too far. He gets too darn good. And then something does happen, see. This is, it isn't just an idea. You can't just go on without limit. So you can't add one thing to another and just simply do anything you want. The only thing uh, being to go, just get rid of the obstacles in a sort of a fair way or something like that. See, it doesn't, no, there's, there's more to it than that. Now, in Antigone, Antigone, who is she? She's the daughter of Oedipus. The Antigone is the third Oedipus play of Sophocles. You've got two big Oedipus plays, and then Antigone is the end of it. And why a play about Antigone in the Oedipus cycle? Well, it's carrying on. This is, the, this is what is left, what's left over after Oedipus goes off into the realm of the gods, because Oedipus doesn't die, really. He kind of disappears into the realm of the gods by a kind of mysterious ascension, which is a very a sort of a mysterious, beautiful thing. And he, uh, uh, but after he has gone on, there is still left something to be taken care of. There is still a lot left over in, in, in the, what's, a lot is yet coming to the family of Oedipus, and Antigone is it. She's the daughter. Now, one of the things that's not sufficiently recognized in Greek tragedy is the place of the innocent victim, and the, uh, who is especially a woman. Antigone is one of them, and another one is the Iphigenia of Aeschylus, Aeschylus which is, a, she again, is, a, is an innocent victim. Uh, she's caught in a kind of a political machinery that in order to get the fleet going to Troy, they've got to sacrifice. A, so, uh, uh, this is another theme. It's the theme of bad advice. See, Somebody has advised her old man, Agamemnon, that he should sacrifice his daughter so that they can get going, so they get, get favorable winds, and he believes them. See, And Darius said of Xerxes, the, the thing that was wrong with him was that he listened to the wrong advice. That's the theme that you get in the Book of Kings, where... Uh, we had it just the other day in the refectory. What was it? Uh, uh, who, who is it that says it now? Jeroboam or somebody like that. But the old man dies, and the, he, he's been pretty tough. The old king dies of, of Israel. And uh, 
the, the, young, the people come to the new king and say, uh, are you going to loosen up a little bit? The old man was pretty tough. Are you going to give us a little bit better? And then this, this king consults two classes of people. He consults the old man. And the old men say, better loosen up a bit. These people are getting kind of restive and you better give them a break. And then he consults the young ones. And what do the young ones tell him? Yeah, yeah he says, uh, says, you go tell those people, king, you go tell those people that my father beat you with whips and I'm going to beat you with scorpions. See, with scor scorpions means whips with, with uh, leaded whips. The old man beat you with ordinary whips and I'm going to beat you with whips with nails in them. See? So, all right, this is, it's again this idea which is a big theme there, you see, of, of the bad advisor, the advisor that, that pushes the king to be too powerful. Now, the problem of Antigone is this. It centers around authority. Antigone is a play about freedom. See, it's one of the great plays about freedom and about the abuse of authority, and it's a play about law and about is there something higher than law? See, and is there a worse crime than to defy the state? See, uh, is... Uh, is the, the summit of virtue simply to obey the, the laws and keep your nose clean and keep out of trouble and, and don't rock the boat, see? Because the philosophy of Creon is don't rock the boat. Anybody who rocks the boat in my state is going to get it, see? That's a very interesting development of this theme, a very modern theme, see? Now, Antigone, her, her brother has been killed fighting against the city of Thebes, fighting against his own city. Now, this is part of the leftover mess of Oedipus. See, because he's a son of Oedipus, he's, uh, he's heading for trouble, he's bound to be in trouble, and in fact he is in trouble, and he gets killed fighting against his own city. So he's a rebel. So Creon says, okay, this fellow was a, was a traitor and a rebel, he's not going to be buried. He's going to be left out there and the birds are going to eat him. And Antigone says, well, he's my brother. I don't care whether he's a rebel or not, I'm going to bury him. Creon says, anybody that buries that guy is going to be killed. So Antigone goes out and buries him. And that's where the play starts. And then, so the first thing that happens is, well, just before she, uh, she has a, there's another one, a sister or some other dame called Ismene is in there. I don't know if she's Antigone's sister or just somebody, one of the, one of the gals. But she is, she comes out with a big argument for obedience. See? And this is, what, this is what's so interesting, is you've got all these people uh, coming in and telling Antigone from various points of view why she ought to obey. And then, and the chorus says why she ought to obey. And then Creon, of course, he's got, he's got plenty of arguments why she ought to obey. <laughs> and then Antigone, uh, each time, either just doesn't obey, or da, 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 uh, she says, no, there's a higher obedience. I owe obedience to, my, to the laws of, my, of, of the gods. See, there is obedience, the obedience which is demanded by love. And this, these laws that you guys have made are artificial laws. They don't make sense compared with the higher law. See? And because the higher law is the one... I choose that, and if you kill me, that's just too bad, I don't care, this is what I have to do, see. And this is the way that the play develops. Now, Ismini comes in and, uh, and, and gives a whole long argument about how, why we're women, we can't, we can't fight the, the tyrant, what do we know? We don't know what we're doing, see. And Tingley says, well, I know what I'm doing, <laughs> so I'm going to go, this is what the gods want, this is what I do, see. And all through here, this is the beginning, you see, of, of, the, of the sense uh, of the state, this is the beginning of the state taking over functions which belong to the gods. And this is, the Sophocles brings this out really clearly, so that what you've got, actually, you've got a play about totalitarian states and obedience. See? And it's a very gripping modern kind of play. Okay. Oh. What was the effect of putting a woman in that place at, at that time in Greece? I don't know, because the woman didn't rate too much. See, I suppose it, was, it actually heightened the whole thing. It, it made it much more impressive because, well, it, uh, it made it much more impressive because precisely the, the whole thing that Ismene is doing is emphasizing the weakness of woman. And then Antigone is showing that woman can be strong. And that's why I say that this question of the innocent victim, especially the woman who is an innocent victim in Greek tragedy, is very, very important. Because Greek tragedy, this, this place of the woman in Greek tragedy gives it a very special power. See, uh, 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 there is, in Greek tragedy, you get a strong emphasis on this polarity between man and woman, and usually man doesn't come out too well. See. If you study the Greek tragedies closely, you find that in most of them, the women are the best, except, I don't know, Euripides. But uh, certainly in, in Aeschylus and, and Sophocles, the women are, usually come out very well, although once in a while you get a real hellion like uh, uh, Clytemnestra, see, 
who's the one who killed Agamem Agamemnon when he came back. See, this, this is this whole Iphigenia story. Clytemnestra is Agamemnon's wife, the mother of Iphigenia. Agamemnon kills Iphigenia, so when he comes back, Clytemnestra is going to get him. And what is he? he comes back from the war all dirty, and she says, oh, honey, you need a bath. So she runs him a nice hot bath, and then when he's in it, she runs him through with a sword, and the bath is all full of blood. And, of course, in, in the Agamemnon, there's a, there's, a, there's a great deal of, this is Aeschylus, and there's a great deal of people rushing off the stage, and then a loud scream, and then somebody pulls a curtain, and it opens up, and there are bodies lying all over the place. <laughs> this is Greek tragedy. But in, in English tragedy, English drama, you get this in the Elizabethans. You get people like John Webster and Thomas Kidd and people like that. With, uh, towards, I mean, the last act of any play by Webster or Kidd is just people falling on their swords or falling on somebody else's sword, but they do it right on the stage. See, the Elizabethans didn't want to have anything happening off stage. It had to be right on the stage. They probably had bottles of ketchup around and so forth to produce lots of blood, which is what they did. Now, uh, we can't go into, obviously, all the details of, of the Antigone here, but it's probably one of the most interesting plays that you can read, and the thing to do is to study the way this thing progresses and how uh, Creon gets to be more and more and more stupid the more and more, the more he insists on his own will and the arguments that he gives out. He gives out one crazy argument after another, which are exactly the arguments of tyrants and people like Hitler and of their authoritarian characters and so forth. They make no sense. They simply that I want to do it, therefore that's the way it's got to be. And then, as, as things go on, he uh, condemns Antigone. Antigone buries her brother, and then somebody digs him up again. She goes back and buries him twice. So then uh, Creon says, okay, we're going to bury you alive. You're so, you're, you're so fond of burying people, and you like the dead better than living, so we're going to wall you up in a cave someplace. So he walls her up in a cave someplace, and she hangs herself in there. But meanwhile, uh, Creon's son comes in here, and, and he tries to tell Creon, now look, everybody says that you're nuts, and I, uh, Antigone is, the, uh, is ready on the right side, and Creon says, yeah, who do you think you are? Okay, you go in the cave too, see. And then he kills himself, or he's killed, or something. And in the end, finally comes on the scene a prophet, the blind prophet Tiresias, who comes on, and he says, uh, when all this is piled up, see, in comes Tiresias, and Creon says, well, Tiresias, what do you see? How are we doing? And Tiresias starts telling him what he sees. And he says, the gods are not going to take a single sacrifice from this joint. They're all rejected. And your enemies, they're on the way from all sides. Places practically surrounded. And uh, uh, you've got you, you've to give up, and you've got to see that this man is properly buried. And so the brother well, who the heck do you think you are? <laughs> and, and, and goes after him, but finally, he, he gives in. And Teresia says, what's going to happen to you is that the Furies are after you, right? And see, the Furies are the ones who always come in at the end of the thing. The, the idea is that the fellow who's really done, done bad, in the end, in come these Furies, see? And they chase him off the stage, and, and you, the, the idea is that they're going to be after him for the next 20 years, see? And he's going to be having a real tough time with these ladies after him. But uh, what finally happens is that Creon, at the end, is simply... Uh, I mean, he's just kind of reduced to a complete psychological pulp by, by the, the whole thing that's happened all through this play. So the thing to do is to read a play like this and to study the speeches that these people make and study the contrast between the speeches and study how the thing develops and then study how it finally works out and, and then meditate on it a bit so that you see what the real meaning is that the Greeks have got out of this. To see, in other words, how this meditation spells out the theme that wisdom is the, comes from suffering. Auditorium, welcome to Melanie Dawson.